I wanted to ask you about Brzezinski's famous comments to a French newspaper years ago um, when talking about why the Soviets even entered Afghanistan, um, wanting the U.S. wanting to embroil them in their own kind of Vietnam, saying, what's a few riled-up Muslims? And so the U.S. supporting the mujahideen uh, mm -hmm. among them that were trained was Osama bin Laden. And then the blowback effect afterwards, first they set their sights on the Soviet Union, then they set their sights on uh, the United States. But how the Soviet Union first went in, take us through that whole trajectory, as you were just describing, when Gorbachev uh, decided to pull out, and then the U.S. getting involved themselves and what the alternative was and is. Well, that's really the incredible thing, because the Americans know what happened when the Russians were there, because they were arming the mujahideen. And, uh, and so then to invade themselves and think that they could do in differently from the Russians is just uh, absurd. I mean, it is just crazy. The real problem was that they conflated the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Uh, it was a marriage of convenience between the Taliban and al-Qaeda. And as soon as 9-11 happened, Osama bin Laden moved from his Kandahar area, where he was relatively visible, to the Tora Bora Mountains, so that when Bush came along and said to the Taliban, you have got to hand Osama over to us, or we're going to invade. It was a completely unrealistic demand. I mean, it's taken the United States nine years to find Osama. How could the Taliban, who don't have night vision equipment, don't have satellites, don't have drones, how could they have located him in Tora Bora at that stage? It was completely unreal. Osama was out of their control. Uh, Not but it, to mention, ultimately, out of their country. Out of, and then, of course, he moved out of the country, and al-Qaeda has been dispersed. It's stronger than it was in 2001, because uh, they've got more recruits, partly because of these constant invasions, Iraq and Afghanistan, that fires people up and gets, ang gets them angry. You say al-Qaeda is stronger than it is, than it was in 2001? Well, I think then? it's got more people around. Um, uh, it, uh, and it's dispersed. It's in Pakistan, it's in Somalia, it's in Yemen, it's in North Africa. It was in Iraq uh, for a time during the you know, last uh, five years and so. So I think it's got more recruits. Maybe they're not as effective as they were, and certainly Homeland Security is much better. And that's what the re reaction to 9-11 should have been improve homeland security, but don't start intervening uh, in Afghanistan. What do the Taliban want now? The Taliban, I think, have changed their line enormously. Mullah Mohammed Omar, at the end of Ramadan uh, six weeks or so ago, put out a very important statement in which he said, in terms, we do not want a monopoly of power in Afghanistan. That's a complete change. In 1996, when they came in, they did have that. He said, we respect all the ethnicities of Afghanistan, and we want them to de develop together. Um, he represents largely a Pashtun constituency, and the Tajiks, who are the other second largest ethnicity, are quite worried. But uh, what, from what Omar is saying, he's uh, trying to reassure them. He even talked about foreign investment, <laughs> bringing investment. He said, we've got mineral wealth and so on. It must be uh, developed. So he's completely changed his line. So I think he wants to, to come into a process of talks. And I think this is really what needs to happen now. I think uh, Obama should now make a declaration that there's going to be a complete change of course, that the war is unwinnable, we are now moving towards negotiations, and that our goal now is a government of national unity in Afghanistan, which will include all the insurgent groups, every kind of group, uh, and that it will make a pledge, of course, that it will not uh, harbor al-Qaeda or any other uh, global terrorist group in its country. And uh, I think he has to lift the bounty on Mullah Mohammed Omar's head. You cannot negotiate with somebody if you're threatening to kill them and to give ransom uh, give money to people who, who, who arrest him. So he, he has to really make a completely radical shift in, in policy and recognize that the interlocutor on the Taliban side has to be Mullah Mohammed Omar or whoever he chooses to uh, appoint as his negotiator. And who is uh, Mullah Mohammed Omar? He is somebody who grew up in the resistance to the Soviet Union. He was part of the jihad, as they called it at that time, the mujahideen against the, the Russians. But he was of a younger generation from the Kandahar area. And like many uh, of these young uh, uh, fundamentalists who fought uh, against the occupier in the 1980s, which was the Russians, he became very disillusioned with the older generation when they finally took power in 1992, because they started a terrible civil war in Kabul. 50,000 people were killed just by shelling from one district of another of Kabul. And uh, there was a lot of corruption. And uh, Mullah Mohammed uh, Omar was really one of these sort of young Puritans, if you like, who said, you know, we want to clean out these corrupt leaders and, and bring in a, a more honest and uh, legitimate kind of Islam. 
of course, they're very hard line in terms of women's rights, and uh, nobody can, you know, accept that. But uh, that doesn't start with the Taliban. The whole point that I'm trying to make uh, in this book, which confronts 13 well-held Western myths about Afghanistan, is that women's oppression long predated the Taliban, unfortunately, and it's continuing in areas of Afghanistan where the Taliban have no control at all. So this is a fundamental traditional policy or practice and custom which uh, will take a long time to, 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 to change and move forward. But it's not as though the Taliban came in and started women's oppression. And yet it is so often used in the United States as the reason the U.S. cannot leave. Um, uh, President Bush's uh, his wife, uh, the First Lady Laura Bush, talked about Afghanistan, the United States being there to free women. And that continues through to this day. Yes. I mean, I, I don't know whether it was done entirely cynically, but if you follow the kind of scenario I laid out at the beginning, <clears throat> that um, they were really trying to go after al-Qaeda, but they knew it was going to be difficult, they thought it was an easy hit to get rid of the Taliban, because they were a sitting target. So instead of hitting the bullseye, they knew that the dart would go somewhere on the board, and that was good enough, because they could say, OK, we've toppled the Taliban, we've liberated women, they're throwing off the burqa, everything's fine, we're bringing humanitarian uh, conditions and, and development to Afghanistan, and that would pacify the, the anti-war opposition. And in fact, it did, of course. Many, many people said, well, OK, they haven't found Osama, but at least it's better for Afghans. And I think if you talk to Afghans now, as I do, you know, they they have very mixed feelings about that. Even uh, uh, women now, uh, many of them are saying that the fundamental thing in Afghanistan is security, to get away from these car bombs, suicide attacks, drone attacks, and so on, and the war everywhere, and particularly in the villages. And that is the overriding thing, is to have peace, because peace is the biggest human right, uh, and, and it uh, covers all genders, both genders. Jonathan Steele, columnist for The Guardian in Britain, a roving foreign correspondent and author. In addition to Afghanistan, he's reported from Iraq, as well as on the Israel-Palestine conflict. His latest book is called Ghosts of Afghanistan, The Haunted Battleground.